All right. Our first speaker for, uh, for the final day of TAM here is Michael Shermer, the one and only Michael Shermer. Um, you know, why people believe weird things, I've said this before, but why people believe weird things was the first book that I read that had the word skepticism in it. And back in 1996, it started me on the path, and I still can't believe that I get to introduce him. It's, it's, it's really, really cool and awesome, and I just can't believe it. So here is his uh, limerick. A skeptical editor chose to, del oh, sorry, his uh, talk is uh, Science and Justice. See, I'm all nervous because I'm like such a fanboy. Science and justice, free will and moral responsibility in a secular society. Here's his limerick. A skeptical editor chose to deliver his keynote in prose, but the MC decided twas his job. He provided rhyming limericks for all the intros. Please welcome Michael Shermer. <laughs> Thanks, George. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK? Very good. Are you having a good TAM? Our last day. I didn't see the, uh, the head count on the first day of how many um, uh, are, t uh, are at TAM for the very first time. How many of you, for, is this a first time TAM? Okay, wow, that's quite a few. Now let me see a show of hands. How many have never been to TAM before? <laughs> okay, if you raised your hand twice, <laughs> you're at the right place. <laughs> we teach critical thinking. Uh, it's just a little humor here because this is a really heavy talk today, so... Uh, uh, basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the final chapters of my next book, The Moral Arc. In the previous two TAMs, I've done snippets of this. I like to try out ideas um, in front of audiences and, and then get some critical feedback uh, before I actually publish something so that you don't say something stupid. So today I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, uh, moral responsibility and free will in a secular society. And, uh, and I begin in these chapters and, and with this talk with um, that... Um, I get a lot of letters from prisoners as the publisher of a, uh, of, a, of a national magazine. Most prisoners have a lot of free time on their hands, so uh, they mostly write because they want free stuff, free magazines, free books, and we try to send them stuff because we know religions send a lot of uh, literature and material to jails, and uh, so we try to accommodate those who don't want that kind of literature. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on this, by the way, you can't send hardback books because apparently you can turn a hardback cover into a weapon. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, I always thought of the pen as mightier than the sword, but maybe the book cover is even mightier than that. Uh, some of them write because they have their theories of everything, as we call them. You know, they figured out that Newton was wrong and Einstein was wrong, and they're in their jail cell. They worked out the origins of the universe, that kind of thing. Um, but mostly, um, they write to either complain about religion in jail, um, or they tell me about their crimes, which is kind of interesting. So I've collected a few of these over the years. Just in the same way that I like to talk to people who believe weird things, just because you want to know what's going on inside somebody's head. Like when I spend a lot of time with the Holocaust deniers and climate deniers, I go over to Freedom Fest every year just to see what they're all about, teach them a little science, and just hear what their arguments are, uh, which we did this year, which was quite amusing uh, to hear what... Uh, I got yelled at by a climate denier who told me that uh, I was in the pay of the government so I asked him, well, I haven't gotten my paycheck yet, so wh where is it? And uh, anyway, but, but that's, a, that's a way to find out why people believe what they believe. And uh, anyway, so in the late 90s, uh, I had a correspondence with a man who was on death row uh, for uh, serial, serial rape and murder of, of women. And uh, he thought we should do a special issue of Skeptic on the death penalty and why it was a bad idea. Well, guess what? He was on death row. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I was disinclined to, to help him in any way for you know, concerns for the victim's families, but I was curious what, what, what was going through his head. So he narrated to me this lengthy story about these urges that he had. And he said it, it, they're so powerful, they would just so overcome him, he just felt like he couldn't control them. For example, after he was convicted and sentenced to death, they said they, he's in the van driving to the prison and they got him, you know, strapped down with the chains and the two guards with the guns there and the whole thing. But there's windows in the vans and he could see people walking down the sidewalk. And he said, I saw this woman and all I could think about was how can I get out of these chains, get out of this van and go rape this, kill this woman. Like, wow, okay, this is not the kind of brain most people have. So what's going on with this guy? And, and then uh, two years ago, I had a correspondence with a, a young man in his early 30s, who was in jail for pedophilia. And uh, he, he told me his whole life story. He was raised in a, 
upper middle class, white family in a nice neighborhood, two parents. Nothing obviously wrong with his background. He just felt, said he always felt attracted to other young boys when he was a young boy. Like at age 8 to 10 or so is when he started having these feelings. And he was attracted to other boys in that age range of 8 to 10. But as he got older, the window never changed. He just was always interested, sexually interested in boys 8 to 10 years old, all the way into his 20s and into his 30s. And, uh, but there was nothing obviously wrong with him that he could find. It's just the feelings he had. And, of course, he thought we should do a special issue of Skeptic on why pedophilia is not so bad. And so, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. But, but, but it does bring up the issue of, you know, what causes people to have these urges. And I'm a psychologist, so I'm interested in those questions. Uh, and in Adrian Raine's book, The Anatomy of Violence, which I'll be talking more about later, um, uh, he, he talks about a guy named Mr. Oft, it's an, a, a, a pseudonym, Michael Oft, O-F-T is his pseudonym, uh, who was a, a man in his 40s who was a, a school teacher, and he was married, had a stepdaughter, and a perfectly normal life until all of a sudden his wife found out, she worked at nights, his wife found out that he was being inappropriate with the stepdaughter uh, when he tucked her into bed at night when the wife was at work. Um, and then he found kitty porn on his computer and so on and so uh, services were called in and he got in trouble. And so he went through all the different uh, tests and so on and he was going to have to go to jail because he just couldn't stop control. He kept, kept hitting on everybody at the, at the mental hospital and at the jail and so on. It's like, okay, this guy obviously has some sort of problem here. Let's just lock him up. And at the last second, he was talking to a psychiatrist before they were about to ship him out and he urinated and he wet his pants just standing there and he acted like this is perfectly normal. And the psychiatrist thought, that's not normal behavior to just stand there like it's cool. Uh, so they scanned his brain and found that he had a brain tumor, uh, sort of deep in, in near the hypothalamus where these sorts, sorts of urges come from, we think. And uh, so they resected the tumor. All the urges went away. He went through all the steps you're supposed to go through and show that you no longer are going to act like that. And he returned home and everything was normal again until his wife found kitty porn again on his computer rushed him back to the brain scanner. Sure enough, the tumor had returned. They resected the tumor again. The urges went away. So the question is, what's the difference between a brain tumor and who knows what from somebody's background? And, but intuitively, we think, well, the brain tumor, he, he's not really a pedophile. He, he's a, he has a brain tumor. It's, it's just a medical condition. He's a victim of a disease, a medical condition, a tumor. Uh, what the other guy is, he's just a pedophile, evil, bad pedophile. But what's the difference between a tumor and an upbringing, whatever it is that we don't know? Uh, that's, the, that's the hard question. So this brings up the question of uh, free will and determinism. I mean, to what extent are any of us free to make these kinds of choices? And these are examples from neuroscience uh, that lead us to believe, lead many neuroscientists to believe that we're determined. Uh, and, you know, the principle of determinism is that, you know, from the, from the Big Bang beginning of the universe, if you know every particle and so forth all the way up into your brains and so on, we'd be able to predict your behavior. If you knew what those causes were, all effects have prior causes going all the way back. And the only way to sneak free will back in, seemingly, uh, the typical thing is to think of that there's somebody in your head, a little homunculus, a little you, that's like looking at the, the, the egg there, uh, on the theater of your mind uh, and reporting back to some other place what is, what is being seen. Uh, but of course there's no you know, homunculus in the brain. There's no, uh, yeah, there's no mini-me in, in your brain because if there were a mini-me in your brain then mini-me would need a mini-mini-me and then mini-mini-me would need a itty-bitty mini-mini-me inside of his brain. Uh, and uh, so most neuroscientists tend to lean toward just concluding that we're determined. They often use research, cite research by people like Benjamin LeBay, uh, who in his classic experiments starting in the 1980s uh, had subjects, um, you know, just, just press a button whenever they felt like it. So the instructions were just press it whenever you feel like it, and, and he had a, a EEG scalp reading on there. And he could see back uh, in the motor neuron areas of the brain to the left there, the buildup, the, the, the neurons are starting to fire to get the finger to press uh, the button. And then he, he, the, the subject becomes consciously aware, I think I'll do it now, and then he does it. 
So the lag time with, an e, with, a, with the EEG readings is not very refined, so it was just fractions of a second, half a second, third of a second, three quarters of a second. Uh, but more research since that time, there's hundreds of experiments like this, so I'm just giving you these two. Uh, John Dylan Haynes, the uh, neuroscientist, um, did something basically similar to this, except the subjects are inside the brain scanner, so they get a more refined reading of uh, exactly when the neurons start firing and when the brain becomes active. And he was able to predict a full seven seconds before uh, the subject said they made their decision, what decision they were making and when. Um, and uh, so that certainly does imply that somebody is calling the shots for you. At least that's the implications. Uh, I think this is a dodgy interpretation of the neuroscience. I think we can look at it a slightly different way, three different ways, that I think we can get to free will. The first is, is the modular mind. Um, the argument that we're not free to choose because an unconscious part of a brain tells the conscious part of the brain uh, what has been decided um, is at best, I think, not the right interpretation. If a subcortical region of my brain tells a cortical region of my brain what the decision is, it's still my brain. It's still me making the decision. So regardless of which part of my brain is making the decision, it's me. And therefore, I'm responsible for myself. Uh, so, and as you know from, uh, from Robert, uh, by the way, we still have copies of this book <clears throat> at the store. Uh, why everyone else is a hypocrite. So he began to look at moral hypocrisy and, and why we can clearly see the con conflict and hypocrisy in other people's brains, but not our own. And the reason is, is because there isn't a you. There is no just unified self. There's no homunculus up there. There's, there's, there's not somebody that runs the show that is held responsible for moral consistency. So there's moral inconsistency, just like there's consistency across the board in all areas, because we have so many different neural networks or modules running the brain, running your body, and so forth, doing lots of different things, often in conflict with one another. In the old days, this was the Swiss Army knife model, and now in Robert's wonderful metaphor, it's the app, the smartphone app. Whatever the metaphor is, uh, lots of different uh, modules up there. In other words, it turns out there are lots of mini-me's inside you. There's mini-me's and mini-mini-me's and so on and so forth, all in uh, doing different things and sometimes in conflict with one another. Uh, and so that's one way to, 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 to back into it, to get, give us free will. There's still, it, but again, it's still you. It's still your brain. A second way is um, through uh, what's, what's called free won't. I didn't make up this term, but I like it a lot. Uh, and it, so we, if we start with the definition of free will that Dan Dennett uses in his book, Freedom Evolves, uh, that free will is the power to do otherwise. Well, that's free won't. That's vetoing uh, a decision. That is, free won't is the capacity to reject a particular action arising from the unconscious neural network such that any decision to act one way instead of another way is an authentic choice. Uh, now, if you disagree with this, you can take it up with Dan Dennett because he's a philosopher and I'm not. But I, I think the neuroscience on this is pretty supportive. For example, Marcel Brass and Patrick Haggard, uh, just to cite one among many studies in the late 2000s, uh, allowed subjects to veto their initial decisions. They could change their mind. In other words, you're, you're in the brain scanner, you got the keypad. By the way, if you don't know how these work, you, you have like this helmet on that measures your brain waves, and you have these goggles, and the goggles have little TV monitors in them that are yoked to a computer outside the room, and then they present you with choices, like Coke or Pepsi, you know, these sorts of things. You see what happens in the brain, and which one generates the most dopamine, and this is a better logo than that. But instead of that, they give you choices, and what, and what these guys did, they said, okay, but at the, at the last second, you can change your mind. And so, even with that, of course, they were able to see how the neural processes happen, but what they found was that um, when subjects chose to veto their initial decision, a specific area of the brain lit up, the left dorsal frontomedial cortex. So it's sort of the prefrontal cortex, but a very specific area you can see lit up in red there, uh, which is normally active during decision making, especially the intentional inhibition of a choice. So they could, their paper, by the way, is called Free Won't, appropriately. So our results provide the first clear neuroscientific basis for the widely held view that people can refrain from doing something even 
if they genuinely want to do it. That's really important. I highlighted that. You can refrain from doing it even if you genuinely want to do it. So if we speculate that the DF, uh, DFMC may be involved in those aspects of personality that reflect self-control. Then interestingly, um, Benjamin LeBay himself, who started this whole process that lead, led people to conclude that we're not free, uh, in his final book of his career, Mind Time, he came down on the side of free will. The role of conscious free will would be then not to initiate a voluntary act, but rather to control whether the act takes place. We may view the unconscious initiatives for voluntary actions as bubbling up in the brain. The conscious will then selects which of these initiatives may go forward to an action or which ones to veto and abort. So just think of it as all those modules and neural networks firing away. Who knows what causes them? We don't know enough yet. Stuff's bubbling up. I feel like doing this. I feel like doing that. I feel like having the donut. I feel like having the bacon. Maybe I'll have both. <laughs> or maybe I'll just have one of each. And I'd like to have ten, but I'll have five. Anyway, there's all these things just sort of bubbling up. And, and so, A, do you actually act on them? And B, do you override them and do something else entirely? So what they're arguing, all of these guys, I think, and I think the case is strong, that uh, it, you still have free choice to resist those urges. Now, of course, you can ask, well, where did the resistance of the urges come from? Well, okay, so that gets us to uh, the process of self-control. It turns out that we can actually do something about this. The best book on this, I think, that I've seen is um, Roy Baumeister and, and uh, John Tierney. John Tierney is a science writer for the New York Times. Roy Baumeister is probably the most interesting social psychologist working today. He's always on top of really interesting topics. And this, this one is on all the literature and research and experiments on how to get people to resist temptation. And, uh, and it turns out it's a little bit like a muscle that you can train for, you can practice for it, you can get better at it with practice. But if you do too much temptation, then the resistance can break down. And so this is why you should not be gambling and drinking late at night because you're tired and your muscles, <laughs> your resistance muscles are fatigued and so on. So it's, it's better to go shopping on a full stomach than an empty stomach because your muscles are going to be resistant more and so on. So all this research shows if you tax somebody's brain by having them do mental calculations and then give them the temptation to eat, you know, a donut or a piece of bacon, something like that, they're more likely to succumb to that if, they, if you fatigue them out. But if you give them little temptations and build up over the course of hours or days, then they're more able to resist. Anyway, the literature on this is pretty interesting. Uh, I think you can will yourself into a behavioral outcome. The most famous research on this that you're probably familiar with is the marshmallow tests of these young children. This was started uh, in the 1960s by uh, Walter Michel, who gave, so the experiment is super simple. You bring a kid into a room, you plop a marshmallow down, you say, you can eat it now, or if you wait 10 minutes, or wait for when I come back, you get to have two marshmallows. And then they tape the kids trying to resist temptation. Uh, but what Walter Michel did was he... Um, he tracked these kids over, these are longitudinal studies, he tracked these kids over their lifetime. The ones that were able to delay gratification, the delay of gratification is what this research was called at the time, uh, they had better SAT scores, better GRE scores, better GPAs, they made more money as adults in their jobs and better careers and so forth. The delay of gratification, learning self-control, willpower makes a difference. So here's where it begins. Here's one of these terrific little videos of these kids resisting temptation. Sure. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. Go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really
fifteen. You can have it now, or you can wait. Okay. I'll be back. Stay in the chair. Okay. Okay. That's too cute. <laughs> I like the one that just nibbled around the edges. It's like if you, if you, you know, take a little bite of your, your partner's dessert, you didn't actually have the dessert, so it doesn't count against you. <laughs> well, as Baumeister shows in his lab, again, you can, you can train people to become better at this through practice. Uh, there's also websites. You can send money to a web, this website. Uh, and your contract with them is you'll stop smoking, say, or whatever it is you're trying to do, lose weight, however many pounds it is. And if you don't, they give the money to some charity you hate, like the other part, political party you're not a member of or whatever. So you just have to fight for this. I mean, uh, again, these, these sorts of little tricks uh, of the trade are, are well documented in this book. Although, see, I think the world is full of temptations, as Oscar Wilde boasted. I can resist everything except temptation. Uh, we can take the religious path of St. Augustine in his pre-saintly days when he prayed to God, Lord, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> he wrote that when he was a young man. Uh, or we can choose the secular path of the 19th century African explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, who proclaimed, self-control is more indispensable than gunpowder, especially if we have a sacred task as Stanley called it. His was the abolition of slavery. In other words, having a goal, something bigger to focus on, allows you to resist the temptations along the way. So self-control is something we can learn. We can override uh, our temptations, uh, those urges that are bubbling up uh, from underneath. A third pathway to freedom is to, uh, free will is, is don't think of, the whole problem of free will and determinism is I think in part linguistic. And in part, we've, we've, we've set it up as a black or white thing. You're either free completely, or you're totally determined and you have no choice. Uh, I think a better way to think of it is shades of gray, which is how social scientists think about problems. Moral degrees of freedom. Uh, so bacteria, for example, or insects have very few degrees of freedom. Fish, reptiles, birds have more degrees of freedom. That is, more choices, more options. Um, and... Uh, and mammals, and of course, especially primates, and, and humans have perhaps the most degrees of freedom. And it has to do with just how complex your brain is. Just, just bolt on more neurons, and you just have more choices, more options in a complex environment. Um, and I think our laws already reflect that. Uh, for example, we have first-degree murder, that is, with malice aforethought, you planned ahead, or second-degree murder, without malice aforethought, or voluntary manslaughter, slaughter, like a crime of passion. You were temporarily overcome by rage uh, uh, in, a, in a crime of passion like that. Or involuntary manslaughter, like a DUI, drinking and driving and killing somebody. Or mitigated murders, like uh, tumors, or PTSD, or who knows what, uh, in somebody's background that causes them to commit murder. Or lawful killings, like war, self-defense, or in the case of a state capital punishment, uh, the state basically has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Capital punishment is the ultimate form of killing in that sense, but it's legal. So in other words, the law already reflects this moral shades of gray, these uh, moral degrees of freedom. So let's look at a couple of cases. This is the story of, uh, on the screen there, is Charles Whitman. In 1966, he was an engineering student and ex-Marine uh, when he murdered his wife and mother by stabbing them through the heart with a knife then drove to the University of Texas at Austin, went to the observation deck of the university's clock tower with a cache of guns and ammunition, and proceeded to shoot and kill 15 people and wound another 32 before being shot and killed by Austin police officer. 
Boy, it's a good thing that never happens anymore. Now that we've gotten control of our guns, <laughs> that's another subject that I, <laughs> I got in trouble with over at the Freedom Fest people. <laughs> you want to ban the Constitution because you won't let crazy people have guns? Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I did one of these debates with John Lott, the more guns, less crime guy, uh, in Texas. <laughs> I was glad to get out of there uh, alive. Anyway, uh, Whitman left a note before he drove over to the, um, to the university. Here's what he wrote that morning. I do not quite understand what it is that compels me to type this letter. Perhaps it is to leave some vague reason for the actions I have recently performed. I do not really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be an average, reasonable, and intelligent young man. However, lately, I cannot recall when it started. I've been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly recur, and it requires a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful and progressive tax, uh, tasks. After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed on me to see if there is any visible physical disorder. Sure enough, the next day they did an autopsy on his brain and they found a glioblastoma tumor pressing against his hypothalamus and his amygdala, which are areas of the brain associated with the fight or flight response and fear and very strong emotions. And the state investigators concluded it was probably the tumor that caused these. Ironically and weirdly for our social legal system, a University of Texas Health Center psychiatrist months before uh, I think it was about six months before, yeah, March of that year, uh, wrote this in his notes. This massive, muscular youth seemed to be oozing with hostility and that something seemed to be happening to him and that he didn't seem to be himself and that Whitman, Whitman told him that he was thinking about going up on the tower with a deer rifle and start shooting people. Uh, fortunately, now I think you're supposed to report uh, statements like that, at least... Um, in some states, you're allowed to do that. In others, you're not. That's still a problem. Uh, so how is, a, again, how is a brain tumor different from just some weird upbringing that rewires your brain in a certain way? This is the question asked by Adrian Rain in his wonderful book, The Anatomy of Violence, The Biological Roots of Crime. This is not a, this is sort of an un-PC topic to actually look at the uh, genetic and biological basis of crime because we all often think of crime as a social thing. Of course, it is a social thing, but it, it probably has a biological route. So instead of thinking of the brain tumor in Whitman, here's a case study that um, Adrian Rain presents that I, I kind of rewrite in my book in which I, in, in an exercise in moral perspective taking, imagine you are this person. Uh, so you are a young African-American male raised in one of the worst neighborhoods in one of the most run-down, crime-ridden cities in America, Washington, D.C. Your grandmother was 14 when she gave birth to your mother, who in turn was 16 when she had you. Your mom was raised by an aunt and uncle who physically and sexually abused her, and she adopted these parenting skills when she raised you. Your father is who knows where, but his side of the family was rife with drugs, crime, and mental illness. By the age of two, you had been taken to the met, uh, emergency room no less than five times for head injuries and other assaults on your small body. You fell out of a car window. You were knocked unconscious by a swing. You fell out of the top of a bunk bed and landed on your head. Like all babies, you cried when you needed nutrition, both physical and psychological. But instead of being fed and hugged and loved, you were shaken in anger, causing your brain to slosh around inside your skull causing even more damage to it. At age three, you were punched in the head by your mother, causing you to have terrible headaches. At age six, you were beaten with an electrical cord. You were often so scared that you wet yourself, and of course you were beaten for that, as you were for bad grades, minor misbehaviors, or for any other trivial reason that took your care fa caregiver's fancy, including burning you with cigarettes. In addition to your horrible home life, neighborhood bullies heaped upon you further abuse, including anal rape. Your peer groups consisted of punks and thugs who robbed and burgled for a living and for fun. By the time you turned 18, you had committed so many robberies and burglaries that you were sentenced to 20 years in prison. After serving four years, you were let out on parole where at a halfway house in Denver, Colorado, you assaulted one of the other residents. 
You were about to be shipped back to prison in Maryland when you decided to rob an apartment in Denver for some quick cash before catching the bus back east. When you were inside of the apartment, however, the female occupant returned home. Terrified to see you, she bolted upstairs where you chased her down and treated her as you've been treated your entire life with violence. You hit her on the face and head. You dragged her by the hair to the bedroom where you tied her up and demanded money. She fought back and things escalated out of control as you proceeded to rape and beat and stab her until she stopped screaming, resulting in her death. You exited the apartment and caught your 130 bus, another day in the life of a man whose entire life can best be described as unalloyed hell. That's his victim. Adrian Rain served on the defense trial, the defense team for Dante Page. Uh, not to g get him free or anything like that, just not to have the death penalty. Uh, and he did not get the death penalty. He's in jail for life. Obviously, the victim's families are not, uh, not so open-minded about, hey, let's look at his background to see what could cause this. But Adrian Rain is a scientist. So as scientists, we want to know what would cause somebody to do this. And the reason we want to know that is so we can prevent it from happening. So Rain documents, not, not only his own research, but that of others, uh, where uh, what they do is they drive these uh, portable functional MRI machines around to prisons and scan the brains of psychopaths and serial killers. This is a, an example of the difference between a normal brain and a murderer's brain. Uh, this is from Adrian Raines' book. Um, so what you see there is uh, shut down as the prefrontal cortex, the whole frontal cortex, but especially the prefrontal cortex there. And Rain describes this picture. Neurological patients with damage to these areas, the prefrontal cortex, show impulsivity, loss of self-control, immaturity, lack of tact, inability to modify and inhibit inappropriate behavior, poor social judgment, loss of intellectual flexibility, and poor reasoning and problem-solving skills, as well as psychopathic-like personalities and behavior. So what we're after here is, well, what's the cause of this? What can we do about it? Because we ought to do something about it. So here I get into my, my little pet peeve about the is ought, the naturalistic fallacy. We cannot say what we ought to do based on the way things are. Uh, baloney. Once we know the cause of crime, say low impulse control, insensitivity to fear and punishment, lack of emotion, uh, empathy, mental illness, violent upbringing, a tumor, if we want to decrease violence in society, we ought to do something to change those conditions, both in society and in the person's most subject to those forces and many others acting upon them. So this gets us to the study of uh, well, the question of justice and what's right and wrong and how should we deal with problems like this? Are we doing the right thing? And so first we have to have a theory of why people commit murders or violence in the first place. So let me ask you a uh, show of hands questions. I'm going to ask you this question on the screen. Have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> See, we skeptics, we can stand strong. <laughs> and I say that because, in fact, most violence is a logical response to somebody who has wronged you. This is the subject. The best book on this is David Buss's The Murderer Next Door. I thought after I, I, I just put this up, I should have found a picture where he's not looking so happy. <laughs> David's a super nice guy, but it's a very serious subject. So he asked this question of you know, thousands of people, um, not, not just college kids, but, 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 but college kids, but you, who you wouldn't expect to have these kinds of fantasies, but lots of other people too. We now have a fairly extensive database of, uh, of those, uh, the percentage of, uh, of both females and males who have considered killing another person either frequently or occasionally. Wow, 80% of men and over 60% of women have either frequently or occasionally thought of killing somebody. One guy said he went 80% of the way toward killing a former friend and now a jealous rival. He wrote, uh, first I would break every bone in his body, starting with his fingers and toes, slowly making my way to the larger ones. Then I would puncture his lungs and maybe a few other organs. Basically, give him as much pain as possible before killing him. A woman said she went 60% of the way toward killing an ex-boyfriend who had threatened to send a video of the two of them having sex to her new boyfriend and to fellow students. 
She wrote, I actually did this. I invited him over for dinner. And as he was in the kitchen looking stupid, peeling the carrots to make a salad, I came to him laughing gently so he wouldn't suspect anything. I thought about grabbing a knife quickly and stabbing him in the chest repeatedly until he was dead. I actually did the first thing, gra grabbing a knife, but he saw my intentions and ran away. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Buss also cites the case of an Australian man named Don who was killed by his wife, Sue, after 14 years of an abusive marriage. So they have the trial transcripts of what happened. Don had become quite abusive, verbally and physically. The latter including many types of humiliation and being hit across the head regularly, being threatened with death, being locked in a closet, and being forced to sit looking in a mirror while Don made derogatory comments about her. On the night of the killing, Don held a knife to Sue's throat while threatening to kill her. He also had both locked her in a closet and urinated in her face. Later that night, after Don had gone to sleep, Sue struck him with an axe to the side of the neck about three times. She then stabbed him in the stomach about six times with a large carving knife. Is there anyone, aside from Don, <laughs> who would not read this account with some sympathy and understanding for Sue? I mean, if someone hit me on the head, humiliated and derided me, locked me in a closet, urinated in my face and threatened to kill me, or did this to anyone I love, I can easily imagine myself swinging the axe with my full moral justice rung up to level 12. Anyway, Bess's point in, in recording the motives is behind these cutthroat fantasies is to confirm the fact that most murders are moralistic in nature. To the, to the murderer, the fantasist who's fantasizing about this, or the murderer who actually does it, um, it's kind of a form of capital punishment. The, the person deserved to die, and here's why. Very little bit of violence is instrumental. I did it because I wanted his watch or whatever. That happens. But most of it is moralistic in nature. And there's a logic behind that. If, if you allow yourself to be bullied like this and don't stand up for yourself, you will continue to get bullied. So standing up for yourself, fighting back, swing the axe if you have to, um, is a form of, of self-defense. So there's, uh, I make the case there's an evolutionary logic to violence, even to murder. Murder, again, is a form of capital punishment. Uh, it's a way of dealing with, uh, with the problem of free riders, bullies, freeloaders, people that cheat, and so on. And uh, so I think we've evolved this sort of dual human nature uh, for good and evil that involves fairness and justice. That is, we have a, a helping urge, but a hurting urge. We're cooperative, we're competitive, we're altruistic, we're greedy. We have our better angels and we have our inner demons. Uh, you can track this, I have tons of data in my book on starting with primates and the, and the terrific research by Franz Duvall and his many graduate students now that have gone on to become professors to do this research. In his book, Chimpanzee Politics, yeah, they have politics. <laughs> uh, the, the basic two rules of morality in chimpanzee politics is uh, one good turn deserves another and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And one of the more interesting experiments, uh, Franz Duvall and his graduate student now, uh, Professor Sarah Brosnan, uh, and this is with, not with chimpanzees, but with capuchin monkeys, so they're much smaller. Uh, they train them, just association, just classical conditioning, uh, to, to associate a rock with a grape. And they like grapes, they're very sweet, and uh, who doesn't? Uh, they're not as good as donuts, but they're good. Uh, compared to cucumbers, they're way better, because cu cucumbers are wet, but they're, they're not sweet, and we have a natural inclination to like sweet things. Anyway, so uh, you just train them to, you give them a rock, and they give you the rock back, and then they get a grape. So they learn, and you can actually do interesting behavioral economics research with this. If you double the price of a grape, you know, the, so the supply is going down, the demand goes up, and, and, and that sort of thing. But in this particular experiment, uh, they did a devious thing where, uh, in, in, in view, full view of, of the other capuchin monkey, they started giving the one grapes, but the other one cucumbers. And the one getting the cucumbers is not happy about this and expresses uh, her displeasure at this. So here's, uh, and it's Franz narrating this video. So I think we'll need the volume up for this. Oops, sorry. We give the rock to her, that's the task. And we, we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. 
she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So, <laughs> so you can see, even in a small brained little uh, monkey, that not even closely related to us in terms of, say, compared to chimps and gorillas, uh, the sense of injustice. This is not fair, and I'm pissed. And I'm going to show you that I'm not. Okay, so this is a signal to the experimenter in this case, but the person who's, who's screwing you, who's cheating you, don't do this, and I am pissed, and I'm going to punish you if I can. And it's also a signal to the others your fellow primates, don't mess around you know, with this. This is not right. So I argue that our emotions evolved in order to direct behavior toward our own survival and flourishing, and specifically moral emotions like guilt and shame, empathy, contempt, vengeance, and remorse evolved to guide our behavior in interaction with others. For example, anger leads us to strike out, fight back, defend ourselves against predators, bullies, and abusers. Fear causes us to pull back, retreat, and escape from risks. Disgusts direct us to push out, eject, and expel that which is bad for us, such as bodily excreta and other disease vectors. Jealousy leads to mate guarding. Love, affection, and caring leads us to help others. So e emotions, again, we, we have sort of a, a dualistic idea about emotions, that there are things floating around up there. We have to, it's always good to remember there's no mind. Sorry, Deepak, there's no mind. There's just brain. It's just neurons firing, and mostly what the brain does is it runs the body. So what emotions do is they're directing the body to do certain things. You're a survival machine, as Dawkins likes to say, and what's the best way to survive and flourish? Pass on your genes. Emotions help us do this. The reason for that is because there's no time to do the calculations. So my thought experiment from the believing brain, recall, um, imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You're a little three-foot australopithecines with a tiny brain. Your name is Lucy. <laughs> and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Well, if you think that the, the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, uh, that's a type 1 error, a false positive. Uh, but no harm. You just become more vigilant and cautious and so on. But if you think that the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. So we are the descendants of those who make snap emotional decisions. All twigs, all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators just in case. And the emotion of fear associated with that directs the organism to move quickly. So why can't you just sit there and get the answer correctly? Just wait in the grass and collect more data until you know for sure. Because predators don't wait around for organisms to collect more data about them. That's why they're stealthy, and that's why they stalk their prey. So emotions are a way of, they're a proxy for doing the calculations to get it right for survival that natural selection did for us. So I'm claiming from that basic argument that moral emotions are the same way. Another good source on this, I recommend Christopher Bohm's book, Moral Origins, The Evolution of Virtue, Altruism, and Shame. Uh, this is the first book I've seen, most of the books on the evolutionary origins of, uh, of the moral emotions focus on positive things, cooperativeness and altruism and so on. Uh, but Chris comes at it from a different angle, that, uh, that there have to be sanctions against bullies uh, that range from social pressure and criticism to shaming, ostracism, ejection, and capital punishment. This is the first time I got to thinking about capital punishment as a form of social control. Uh, and, and Chris pr presents in his book the first time anyone ever illustrated this. This is from uh, tens of thousands of years ago. It's, it's ten warriors or whoever, ten people holding their bows up and one guy lying on the ground with ten arrows in his body. So Christopher uh, 
interprets this as being uh, the first form of capital punishment. And in his book, he documents that um, at least half the societies that have been studied in his database have capital punishment as an ultimate means of controlling somebody who just will not come around with shaming and gossip and, and a strong talking to. My dad used to call it a sales meeting because he was a car salesman. And he would have a sales meeting with a salesman. And then when I got in trouble, he'd, we're having a sales meeting. I went, oh, no, a sales meeting. I know what that means. <laughs> Get a talking to. So uh, when all that doesn't work, if worse comes to worse, you've got to take the guy out behind the garden or out on a hunt, and he just doesn't come back. So they do that. Um, anyway, so this leads to many other questions that I don't have time to go through. Like the death penalty, how, how far is too far? Should we give the state that kind of power over life and death? I used to think we should. I've changed my mind about that. Uh, I, I am sympathetic to the victims. Pey Peyton Tuthill's uh, family, of course, they would have preferred that Dante Page get the death penalty. But as a society, too many errors are made. The state has too much power already. We need to knock that back a little bit. And, uh, and we are the last of the Western industrial countries to still have it. But even that, I think the death penalty is on death row. Uh, there's only really two states, Texas and Florida, who practice it with any regularity. Everybody else, the people on death row, pretty much die of old age. And that's probably a good thing. So I'm going to finish up with uh, one last short video here that really captures nicely, I think, this dual moral nature that we have of helping and hurting, of of rescuing somebody and revenge against the harmed person's perpetrator. Uh, and so this is a little video. I just found this online. I don't really know the back story to it. But you'll see um, three people standing on a, like a subway platform. And it's a, a, two men and a woman. And the one guy reaches out and shoves the woman backwards. And she stumbles back and falls into the pit. And the, the man she's with like reaches to grab her and, and misses. And she's down in the pit. In the, I don't, you don't know if the train is coming or not. And he kind of takes a move to, like he's going to help her. And then he stops and turns around and just cold cocks this guy a beauty. And then twice. And then he stops. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. And then he rushes back and pulls her out of the pit, says something to her like, are you OK? And then it's like, then he bolts out through the door to chase after the guy like, I'm going to beat this motherfucker. And, and then I'll show it to you twice. Here it is the first time. Boom. What? Oh, yeah. You okay? Okay. Now, look at it again in that context. But look at the guy at the top of the screen who comes running down the moment he sees her fall into the pit. He's carrying something. He almost looks like he might be an EMT guy or something like that. But does he run over to help the guy pull this woman out of the pit to rescue her? No, he goes after the perpetrator. Watch him at the top there. And boom. <laughs> wow. So I think that nicely captures that, oh, those urges are so strong. The moralistic nature of seeking revenge against somebody who's harmed one of our fellow group members is very strong, which is why we have to be very careful about not overdoing it, about you know, moral witch hunts and things that get carried away like that. It's because it's easy to engage people's emotions like that on a deep level. And uh, so the whole point of a civil society since the Enlightenment, this is the thesis of my book, is that there's a rational way to do this, and that the religious way or decrees by fiat from holy books of what's right and wrong have not worked. And the Enlightenment philosophers we we're familiar with, and some you're probably not familiar with that I, I talk a lot about in my book, uh, like Cesare Beccaria and, and uh, Jeremy Bentham, they said, hey, the punishment should fit the crime. Whoa, proportionality. Now, there's an abstract concept. Uh, and maybe the society will be better off if we have a scientific, rational discussion and analysis of crime, punishments, what's the best way to deal with these problems. And I think Adrian Raine's book and others, uh, this is an important first step, the biological origins of crime, why are brains designed like this? 
And so I was inspired to write this book by, uh, of course, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous How Long speech, uh, in which he said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think that's almost entirely due to the Enlightenment emphasis on science and reason and, the, and applying the methods of science to solving social problems. We don't often think of things like political systems and crime and punishment as a scientific problem, but it is a scientific problem, no different than any other. And, and we have to apply the best, method, best methods of reason and science to do that. Uh, in terms of this dual nature, uh, King also wrote, I'm going to finish with this, each of us is two selves. The great burden of life is to always try to keep the higher self in command. And every time that old lower self acts up and tells us to do wrong, let us allow that higher self to tell us that we were made for the stars, created for the everlasting, born for eternity. Well, I'm a great admirer of King, but of course he was a preacher. Uh, and, I, and I think there's another way to think about that, that we are in fact made from the stars. Our atoms were forged in the interiors of ancient stars that ended their lives in spectacular paroxysms of supernova explosions that dispersed those atoms into space where they coalesced into new solar systems with planets, life, and sentient beings capable of such sublime knowledge and moral wisdom. We are stardust, we are golden, we are billion-year-old carbon. And morality is something that carbon atoms can embody given a billion years of evolution. That's the moral arc. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer. Thank you. Thank you so much.